Tonight on Life on the Rock, we have Bishop William Byrne, part one. We'll see one of his videos and much more. Welcome to Life on the Rock. We have Bishop William Byrne of the Diocese of Springfield, Massachusetts. And it's not very often that we have a bishop on Life on the Rock. So we took the opportunity to really just pick his brain a little bit about his life, his vocation, and his also his book that he wrote. This is going to be a two-part series. This is episode one of two. So please join with us next week as well. And we're now going to a video with Bishop Byrne. In the 21st Psalm, we hear, God sends his angels to guard over your ways. You see, this is the basis of our teaching on guardian angels, that angels surround God and then God sends them, that's what angel means, to come and protect each one of us, to inspire us. So here's five amazing things about our guardian angels. Number one, guardian angels sweat the small stuff. Your guardian angel's with you all the time praying for you and helping to inspire you to make good decisions, whether it's small stuff like too much butter on your English muffin to big stuff and how you plan your life out. Number two, angels are great examples, actually. You see, Thomas Aquinas, St. Thomas Aquinas said that angels work together for the good of all humanity. And that reminds me, I should be working with others for the good of all humanity, not just thinking about me, but making sure that I'm thinking about others. Number three, better than texting. When I'm trying to get in touch with somebody and I can't reach him, I ask my guardian angel to ask their guardian angel to tell him to return my phone call. It works. Number four, which is actually a follow-up to number three, turn their receivers on. Our guardian angel is there, and especially if we open our hearts to hear him. But if somebody's not thinking about their guardian angel, that's why we need to ask our guardian angel not just to talk to their guardian angel, but ask me next time I talk to them to listen to their guardian angel. Number five, they're real. Those little God winks, the nudges that you get, they're our guardian angels sort of breaking into the noise. And there are no coincidences for people of faith, just providence. So listen up and trust those nudges because they are real and they're from your angel. Those are five Great things about guardian angels. Hey YouTube, thanks for watching our videos and we hope you liked them. If you did, push the like button and also subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching and God bless. Bishop William Byrne, thank you so much for being with us on EWTN. Sorry you did, couldn't come down and actually visit us in our studios, but we're so happy to be able to talk to you and just find out a little bit about you, about your family life, about your vocation story. I was privileged to be able to watch your Episcopal ordination, so it's great for me to be able to interview you, you right now. Thank you, Father John Paul. I, too, am sad that I can't be there with you. I wish I could in person, but I'll have to come back down next time. Yeah, absolutely. Bishop, we have, j just, just looking at you, I think we have a lot in common. <laughs> we have the same barber, <laughs> the same hairdresser. <laughs> uh, but in reading the book, um, I found out that you're a missionary of mercy, and so am I. Uh, we were oh, both, really? So we, we were in Rome at the same time. Yeah, we were both commissioned by Pope Francis during the Jubilee Year of Mercy as missionaries of mercy. So I, I feel like I have already a connection with you in, in reading your book and just being with you here today to kind of just talk about um, per pertinent issues of our time and just talk about Jesus. I think that's what you want to That's what you want to do, I think, in, in reading your book. You just want to bring others to Jesus. I love that's one of my that's my favorite thing to do talk about Jesus so let's get started Bishop let's talk about your your family your vocation story just growing up in your family uh, what was it like uh, in your household how was your vocation nourished so I'm one of eight kids I'm the baby of eight kids 
And I think everyone in my family would agree that I'm the baby of eight kids. I, I, I joke that I didn't learn to walk till I was about 15. <laughs> when you have older brothers and sisters, they always are bossing you around and telling you what to do. So um, both of my parents, my father was a, a surgeon. We lived in uh, suburban Washington, D.C. My mom was a, an awesome mom, still is. My dad has gone to the Lord this time, but they were daily communicants. And um, and so they were faith-filled people. They attempted to try and get us to do a family rosary you know, in May and October, not always successful. We'd end up fighting over who would get to lead what decade or uh, whatever. And um, so faith and, and the Catholic faith were just part and parcel of the air that we breathed. And um, I, of the eight kids, I have 20-something nieces and nephews. My sister is a religious, Okay. Uh, sister Dee Dee Byrne, okay. um, that many people might know yes. uh, from her pro-life work. And uh, she's also a surgeon. Um, and so I went to Catholic schools. It was interesting. We were a family, a Catholic family, but my dad had always had to go on call and go to the hospital. So whatever, he went to one mass. My mom would be working as sacristan in another mass. So we didn't have to go to mass together. You just had to go. And so people have this image. We were never lined up in the pew from top to bottom. It was a little more bedraggled than that, but uh, we, it, I think it made us own our faith early on as we rode our bikes to church and things like that. I think a lot of people think that uh, us priests uh, just kind of drop, uh, drop out of a tree. Um, talk about your own vocation story. Uh, did you think about being a priest younger or was it something that kind of you thought about uh, later after college or... So it's interesting. My my father's oldest brother, who had a great deal of influence on him, um, is the late Father John Byrne, who was a priest of the Archdiocese of New York. So Father John was uh, in our family mix. We would uh, vacation with him. We'd go clamming. They had a, he and some of his sisters had a little beach cottage up in New York, and we would all be sent up there, and he would take us out and... Um, We'd have mass with them. So it was always just part of the normal experience of in family life. We saw a priest. It, you know, you could be a doctor. You could be a priest. You could be mm. all different sorts of things. So it wasn't like becoming a priest was suddenly this shocking, unusual yeah. thing in our family life, which is a blessing. Um, so it was always somewhere in the back of my mind. Um, but it wasn't necessarily it was something I, I played priest as, as uh, a little kid. Um, but I was always sort of open to many different things. Uh, so when I went to college, I went to a school in Ear, right near me, at the College of the Holy Cross, a Jesuit school. I'd gone to a Jesuit high school, so when I was feeling this call to be a priest, I, um, I thought, well, I'm supposed to be a Jesuit, I guess. Hmm. And I debated that. Um, I went to sort of a come-and-see weekend, and I realized, I don't think I'm supposed to be a Jesuit. And I talked to a Jesuit, and he said, listen, you have to understand, to be a Jesuit means you're called to a community. Hmm. To be a diocesan priest means you're called to the community. Yeah. Think where God wants you to be. Does he want you to be out in the neighborhood preaching the gospel? And that sort of switched the whole paradigm for me. Hmm. And, um, and so I was able to sort of think, oh, no, I want to be baptizing babies and, uh, and doing funerals, and I want to be in the neighborhood. So that was part of the discernment. Did you have a moment where you really, it was like a come to Jesus type moment where, where the Lord really in, entered into your life in a powerful way? And I was talking to, we had a retreat for St. Mary's in Westfield, our Catholic, one of our Catholic high schools. And I was just telling them the story today that um, I was out of college and, <clears throat> excuse me, I was out, just out of college and... Um, and I was going to church-ish, mostly, you know, and my parents, they had, they, they were celebrating their 40th wedding anniversary, and they said, we want to take anybody who wants to go, we're going to go to a couple shrines, Lourdes and Fatima and Rome as a special pilgrimage of Thanksgiving for 40 years of marriage. And so I was like, sure, I'll go on a free trip to Europe. Why not? You know, we, I climbed on board. We were in Lourdes. 
And uh, we had all gone our different ways, and we decided we would agree to meet in the Crypt Chapel. I think that was my idea because it was air conditioned. <laughs> uh, so I sat down in the Crypt Chapel waiting for everybody, and I, and I sort of just looked around and not noticed that there was a monstrance with the Blessed Sacrament mm. on the altar. Mm. And I looked up, and it was this, as if the Lord hit me with a, a baseball bat. And he just basically put into my heart, I'm here. This is real. It's all real. It's sort of a moment of just clarity of saying, wait a second, Christ is the eternal Son of God. He so loved the world that he sent his Son, that, that he gave us the Church, the Eucharist. And so that sort of began um, a more serious discernment for me. As Bishop, Bishop, that's so interesting. Uh, just in my own life, uh, I came back to the faith when I was 21, and I had one of those type experiences uh, in that if that's really God on the altar, what else is there? Um, right. <laughs> what else is there in the world if that is the greatest gift given to us in the Eucharist? You know, I kept on going back to adoration. I kept on going to daily Mass, and it was that within that context that I felt Christ calling me to serve Him. Bishop, yeah, and what, what is I your... want to tell you one quick story. Sure. So after that, after that, I met with the vocations director, and he said, you know, you need to get a spiritual director. Mm. So I asked around, and I got some recommendations, and I finally approached uh, a young priest who was working at the nunciature. Um, he was a priest of St. Louis uh, who was working at the nunciature in Washington, where I was uh, working at the time. And I met for uh, two and a half years with Father Tim Dolan, you might have heard of him. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so that was great. It's been a friendship ever since. He was at my Episcopal ordination uh, just last December. So. so he's like a mentor to you, really, as somebody that yeah, you looked really. up to and helped, helped in your formation. I think behind every vocation is another priest, is a priest that has encouraged us, and invited us to, you know, consider the priesthood. Absolutely. I mean, I think you look and you say, I'm sort of, I'm the priest that is the best of all the priests I've known. You know, I've mm. taken a little bit from here and the pastoral sensibilities and um, the, the uh, preaching way from this guy. Uh, and so the more that we can the, glean from these fathers, yeah, the, the better priest we become. Yeah, I think I've only been a priest for eight years, but I can, I can even see in my own life kind of like scattered things of, of every single priest that I've come into contact with that have influenced me. Um, I'm going to tell you, can I tell you another sure, story? Sure, absolutely. Oh, no, go ahead. So I was ordained about, I don't know, maybe 12 years. I was chaplain at the University of Maryland. Mm -hmm. And during uh, college, I had done a semester abroad. And um, I'd gone, my college roommate and his now wife, he was, he was went on another program and she was on the similar program that I was on, whole group of us. And one night I had confided to her in my junior years that somewhere in the back of my mind was, I was thinking about being a priest. So fast forward 15 years or whatever, I don't even remember how many, I'm now been a priest for 10, 12 years. And she finds her journal from that junior year, you know, a decade and a half before. And she said, she notes, she said, you know, I, uh, she said, Billy told me that he's thinking about becoming a priest. I don't think he'd be a very good one. <laughs> <laughs> she says, he doesn't seem overly religious and sometimes he's kind of selfish. <laughs> and, so, and she said, it's funny. I can only think of you now. She told me uh, these years later as anything, I can't think of you anything but a priest. Mm. But it's, so it's just for any of the guys that are out there listening, God works with what he's got. Yes. It's God's initiative. Yes. So he can take the most uh, moldy clay and turn it into a vessel if he desires. So don't look around. If you're looking around, don't look at your most likely candidate. Yes. Sometimes it's the least likely candidate that, like yourself, as you were saying, that for God sure. is going to use is God's going to use. So uh, that's another little story. Yeah, I, I always tell young guys, too, and also girls who are discerning religious life, 
that there's only so much discernment that you can do outside of actually trying it, outside right. of actually going into the seminary or discerning, going, going and visiting a religious community and actually trying, actually entering postulancy, novitiate. I think a lot of guys just need to get off the fence and just actually try. What do you think? Right. The first call is not to priesthood. Mm -hmm. The first call is to seminary, is to discernment, is to postulancy. Um, I've had a lot of guys that I've worked with who have become priests. I, there's 14 priests, little priest brothers from my eight years at the University of Maryland mm -hmm. um, that all became priests that were students there. But mm -hmm. And I kept on saying to them, you don't decide if you're going to be a priest. If you think you're going to be a priest now, we don't want you. We want you to be a discerner yeah. and open to God's will. And then the Lord will tell you. Yes. It's not me discerning alone, but it's a whole myriad, a whole, a whole bunch of people. It's formation. It's, it's the diocese. It's a religious community. It's not just me trying to discern my, my path. Exactly. Exactly. Well, Bishop, we have about four minutes left in this show, but I thought that we would just introduce uh, the book um, that you wrote, Five Things with Father Bill, Hope, Humor, and help for the soul. Thank you so much for, for writing this great book. I think it's going to contribute so much to people's everyday spirituality. Um, in the beginning of the book, I like it when it said uh, you t gave the story about uh, your favorite number. Maybe you can kind of conclude mm -hmm. the show about the story about your favorite number. Well, it's just always been, it's not like I had any uh, great spiritual, I just always liked the number. And it was sort of long enough that you could get information in, the, the, but also short enough that you could remember. Mm -hmm. So the book is a whole series of five, five um, things, five things I learned from my dog or five uh, mysteries of the rosary. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I also think, you know, it's, it's, we've got five fingers on a hand. So uh, you can still dr I drive stick shift, so I can still do the rosary if I can't find my rosary. <laughs> And on one hand, because I need the other to shift. And um, it, it's just, uh, for me, that was, the, that was the inspiration. What was your, 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 the one that comes to mind that you tell the most to people? Maybe especially I think it's to five children. Things, I think uh, five things I learned from my dog. That's okay. where I started the book. There. Yeah, that was number and one if you for open you. Up, if you open up the back cover of the book, if you hold it up for a sec, you can see my current dog yep. with me right there. There's Zelly. And uh, Zelly's right here next to me right now. She's my evangelization machine. So many people, when I go walk around, they come up to talk about the dog. I call her now the Episcopal. <laughs> <laughs> so the one thing that I learned from my dog, you know, is like how to teach me how to react to God. is If I say, Zelly, let's go. She doesn't ask where we're going or how long we're going to be there. She jumps in the car. I need to be the same way with God. God says, let's go. I don't need to say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, what, where are we going? It's, I need to just say, I'm here, Lord. Let me follow you. Or another mm -hmm. example would be when um, uh, if I'm out late and she's around the house, uh, she doesn't get uh, passive aggressive or she's just glad to see me. She's like, you're home, you're yes. home. And so how often teaches me about forgiveness. Do I want to sort of, as opposed to just saying, I'm so glad that you're here. I forgive you for being late or whatever. That's another example of that sort of things I learned. And I need to be, that's how God is with me. And I need to be that way, to be quick to forgive and to be joyful to see someone arrive. Amen, Bishop. We'll continue this conversation next week with our audience. Uh, Bishop Byrne, thank you so much for joining us this week, and we ask our audience to tune in next week for uh, episode two, kind of continuing this conversation with uh, Bishop Byrne. Thank you so much, Bishop. Thank you, Father John Paul. Brother John, it was just so refreshing mm -hmm. just to, to see a bishop on Life on the Rock, to talk to a bishop and to get his insights, uh, not just into this book that he wrote, uh, Five Things with Father Bill, yeah. but just to get his understanding about 
vocation right. in general, just to get his background and understanding of what it means to be called by God, to be called to be a disciple of Jesus. Yeah, and I, I like a lot of the uh, points that he made is that whenever we do feel a call to the priesthood or mm -hmm. to something of the religious life, it's not just an immediate thing, but we're really called to a discernment, you know, and we're called to first take that initial step to maybe discern with the community or with the diocese through the seminary. And I think that's very important for our f formation overall um, because we can easily kind of romanticize about things of what's not, you know, instead of being grounded in what's real, you know, and there's a lot of challenges that come with, you know, living out the vocation, but it's God who really gives us that grace and God wants us to take the time to discern, you know, and work with really priests and mentors around us. Yeah, Bishop talked about how a vocation is, first of all, God's initiative. Mm -hmm. It's our response. Yeah. But first of all, the vocation itself is God's initiative. It's God yeah. moving out toward us. And Bishop talked a lot about uh, leaning into Jesus. Mm -hmm. You know, answering a vocation too is, is, Jesus, is Jesus leaning in, but also is us leaning in too. Right. Yeah. You know, there, there's this dialogue. Yeah. To way back and forth. And a lot of times we think we have to be perfect, yeah. but that's not the case. A lot of times our lives are messy, yeah. you know, and it's really God's grace that comes in and cleans us up and gets us going. And uh, a lot of times we don't always have the answers or we, we don't always kind of know where to go or look to. But again, God's going to move us into that direction that he wants us. So. Yeah, I wanted to challenge y'all today. If you're thinking about the priesthood or religious life, mm -hmm. You know, just to try it. There's only so much discerning that you can do actually outside of actually trying it. You know, to call your vocation director, call a religious community, maybe even visit one. And I will give you a blessing with the relic of St. Maximilian Kolbe. And this priest is incredible. I mean, this priest laid down his life for Jesus Christ. May the blessing of Almighty God through the intercession of St. Maximilian Kolbe be upon you upon you and your discernment to help you to follow Jesus, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. See you next time on Life on the Rock. God bless you. For all that you are And all that you've done We get